you are born again tomorrow. I'm sure we got a few visitors. I'm going to encourage you to fill out this card there in a few rounds. Turn with me in your Bible to John chapter 10. We're able to bring the Bible with you, whatever we read. It's in page 1072 and 1073 of the Pew Bible, and it's the Black Bible. Can you see that? You like it? You see one of those? We're just going to jump right in and then, and then back up to the okay? So we, we, we got through half the chapter last week. Uh, we're going to start at chapter 22 today. John chapter 10, verse 22 says, At that time, the feast of the dedication took place in Jerusalem. And it was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. Now, you need to know that where we left off last week at verse 21 and where we're starting this week at verse 22, uh, some time has gone past in between the two times. Um, but Jesus has been very busy during this time. Probably somewhere around three months have gone by. Um, and I kind of did a little research and I found, I believe, probably more, but at least 14 different events that took place between verse 21 and 22. And all of them are recorded in the book of Luke. Uh, Matthew, Mark, John, virtually silent on the events that took place in this period of time between verses 21 and 22. And Luke tells us that it was during this season, as you'll recall from some of the other Gospels, that Jesus sent out his 70 disciples to the city. Um, he gave the parable of the Good Samaritan to the New Testament. He visited Mary and Martha, and that time he was in their home, and Martha got upset because she was doing all the cooking, and Mary was hanging out and see the Jesus. Remember, the Jesus told her that Mary had said she was in the Martha. So that happened <laughs> during this period. He taught the disciples during this period how to pray, and when they came and asked him how to pray, and from that we get what the first comfort that the Lord prayed. Jesus taught about his second coming during this period. He, he uh, <coughs> predicted his crucifixion. He healed a woman with a crooked back. You might remember that story. He bumped heads with the Pharisees. Surprise, surprise. He was always good in that. And then he warned other people about the Pharisees. <laughs> and those are just some of the things. There are more that, that I know about, but you can't go there. But Get an idea how busy he was between verse 21 and 22. Well, these two verses we just read tell us that it's no longer fall, it's now winter, verse 23 tells us. And I have to wonder if John here is making a dual point. Now, John's pretty good about telling us where we're at, what time of the year we are, what's going on, and all that. So it could be that just that's going on. John just wants us to know it's winter. But I'm thinking maybe there's a little more. Maybe there's a, a spiritual uh, concept here as well. Maybe John tells us that it's not just the temperatures that have gotten cold. We finally reached that point where a lot of the parts of people have really grown cold. We're only about three months out of the salt. And I think maybe John's trying to tell us it's a very cold time in the heart. We'll see that today uh, in the rest of this passage. So here we read that, that Jesus was attending another feast. See that it's several feasts now. This one was it's interesting that this one is the feast of dedication. It's interesting because this is not one of the feasts that's on the annual list for Jews to always celebrate from an Old Testament time. This was a kind of this was an additional feast, and Jesus is there celebrating it anyway. Uh, do you want to know what this feast is called today? Okay, there you go. 
It goes into the clues. First clue is the first one to three. It's when. The second one is it takes place usually in December. We know it as Hanukkah. Okay? So did Jesus ever celebrate Hanukkah? Yes, he did. We have it right here in the Bible. And I'm sure you've heard of Hanukkah. It often coincides with our Christmas holiday. And Hanukkah always begins on 25 Tishrei in the Jewish calendar. <laughs> and, but it's kind of like um, it's kind of like our Christmas day in a way. It doesn't fall on a certain it falls on a certain day, but not a certain day. And it's even kind of more like our Easter. It doesn't even fall exactly in a certain month. It could actually take place any time from late May November to early December on high calendar. Interesting that this year, 2024, 25 kids left, and December 25th is going to be on the same day. Hanukkah and Christmas will be on the same day. This year, no extra charge for that. That's the point. Just to give you a quick little history about Hanukkah. Uh, it's the result of a Jewish revolt uh, and a victory that happened during the intertestamental period. Say that fast. That is that period of time between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament, some 400 years. From our study that we went through in Daniel last year, some weeks ago, I can't remember that. Anyway, you might remember how we talked about Alexander the Great. When he died, he left his kingdom, the Grecian kingdom, to uh, four of his generals. They kind of fought among themselves in different territories for all these years. Finally, we get down to the generation that produced a fellow named Antiochus of Remember that guy? An absolute madman, a wicked madman who had an unusual hatred of the Jewish people. He was uh, the Syrian king and the Seleucid dynasty. He was always at war with the Egyptian king. And you know what lies right at the point of Syria? In Egypt, Israel. They were always scrambling over Israel to, to fight their battles and so forth. And this guy had just become a great hater of the Jewish people. So much so that at the height of his reign in 167 BC, he attacked Jerusalem. He went into the temple. He killed a pig there. And he sprinkled the blood of a pig on the altar of God. And then threw out the temple. The Jews do that as the abomination of desolation. And then he burned the scriptures that he found there, and he killed lots and lots of the Jewish people, and he slayed lots more. And he really attempted to completely destroy the Jewish religion. He wanted to um, Hellenize it. In other words, he wanted to shift it all into Greek. He uh, wanted to wanted to worship Zeus. He used that to epiphany. Simply, it is a, it's a word that means that he is a god. He thinks he was a god. He thinks he was Zeus himself in some writings. And he wanted all the worship to go to him and to get rid of the Jewish religion. Well, that didn't fit well with some of the Jewish people. We get Larry McMahon to come up here now and give us the, the history of the Maccabees. <laughs> because he knows that he'll be studied up on it. Whether he remembers it, that's another thing. But there was a Jewish priest by the name of Mattathias Maccabee. And he had five sons, and he got together with them and lots of other people. They had to flee to the mountains to make the pass on the son of Jerusalem. But he gathered an army, and he wasn't going to have it. He wasn't going to have the temple and, and, and the religion of God being desecrated. And so he gathered up an army, and... Uh, during that time, he died. But his third son, Judas, was kind of the leader of the brothers. And he, he gathered those brothers and all those folks around. And on 25 Tisleb, 164, exactly three years to the day after he passed the Pacific and wrecked Jerusalem, they liberated Jerusalem. They took it back. And in the process,
process of that, they attempted to reestablish worship to the one true God. And so they rededicated the temple. They reinstated the ritual of lighting the menorah. You know about the Jewish menorah, seven candles. And they, they started to do that. But because they had to, they had to do that with not just olive oil, but pure olive oil, purified olive oil. And that had to be sealed by the high priest to say, this is purified olive oil. And then because Antiochus' army, when they came in and wrecked everything, they destroyed all of the jugs of purified oil. Except, yeah, they found one that had the, had the uh, seal of the high priest on it. So one priest of purified oil. But one cruise would only last for one day. But they decided to go ahead and do that because they knew it would be eight days before they could get any more. Because here's what, here's the reason. In order to make pure oil, one has to be in a state of spiritual purity. And because these are the Maccabees, the, the army that came back in, they had just come from a battlefield, even right down in Jerusalem. And so, of course, there were dead bodies, corpses everywhere, because that's what a battlefield looks like. And because they, there was, there was a, a, a ritual that you could not be handled anything spiritual until you had been purified, and that was a seven-day process. And so the process to become purified and the process of being pure for one more day would mean it would take about eight days to make more oil. So what they did miraculously, they lit that menorah thinking it would burn out in one day. But it lasted one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, until the new oil was ready. And the Jews looked back at that, and they now they also call Hanukkah sometimes you see the feast of dedication, sometimes it's called the feast of light, because the lights were lit and they continued the light. But now they have another menorah that is a nine candle first, and they can celebrate Hanukkah. There's one candle in the middle; they just light that to get light to the room to get started. But then every day for eight days they light another candle. So it comes from seven to eight. And so now I'm doing Hanukkah. So if you ever see that and wonder what was that all about, well, that's what that's about. The point is, again, Jesus is at one of these Hanukkah feasts and festivals. And he didn't ignore this very important feast of the dedication, even though it wasn't one of those prescribed feasts. So we read here that he was on Solomon's porch. That's a grand and covered walkway that. That, that ran down with down practically the whole side of the temple complex. Had these massive columns that were built for King Solomon, who built the first temple, a magnificent structure. And it, it was this one as well that this portico or this court is on the eastern side of the temple in the temple's outer court. Likely this was chosen because it was covered. People would walk along this walkway because it's winter time, and they want a covered walkway, and so that, that's where Jesus was. Now, I want you to notice that the Bible tells us that Jesus, he's just walking along. I mean, he's just walking down what we would think of the covered sidewalk, even though it was massive. But he's walking along when the Jews, and you remember John uses that term many times, to speak about the religious Jews, the Pharisees, and so forth. And these Jews just swoop down on Jesus like a bunch of ninjas. Matter of fact, the King James, New King James Version says they were surrounding Jesus. So just imagine the moment. He's just walking along, maybe with his disciples, mind his own business, and all of a sudden these religious folks just swoop down on him and totally surround him so he can't go any further, and they begin to interrogate him in a very hostile way, a very argumentative way, which was their nature. Now, obviously, due to the ongoing feast, what I just told you about, I told you about it for this reason. 
these Pharisees, these religious folks, and a lot of the other people were looking for a Maccabean type Messiah to come. They were they were looking for the coming coming Messiah, but they were looking for a Messiah that would come and operate in the spirit of the Maccabees. In other words, come in with a military force and just destroy the enemy. That's the kind of Messiah many of them were looking for. We read in verse 24. The Jews then gathered around him and they were saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Now, as a Bible student of first century history, which I kind of have to be, you know, to, to learn all these things and share them with you, I find this to be kind of interesting. This question, you know, how long are you going to keep us in suspense if you're the Christ of power? I find it humorous because Jesus has been, he spent this entire gospel so far, along with the others, the other gospels, telling them and showing them already exactly who he was. I mean, talk about having eyes that cannot see and ears that cannot hear. That's who we're dealing with here. <laughs> but at the same time, as a student of the history, I also must understand that Jesus rarely claimed to be the Messiah in direct terms when he was speaking to this religious crowd. So why, why did he do this? Well, for this reason, because in that day of Roman dominion, the Jews hated the Romans. They hated it that they had their thumb on them. And they were totally over to control of them. But in that day, the title Messiah was a very politically charged title. It was a very militarily charged title. And so the Jews at that time were looking for, actually they were longing for, a conqueror that would come to set them free of Roman dominion. And in their mind, that would be the Messiah. And so now, of course, we know that Jesus was that long awaited Messiah. He was prophesied in the Old Testament, but a close examination of the prophecy revealed that Jesus was going to be the kind of Messiah that would come, instead of taking people's lives, he would come and lay down his own life in order to save people, and not just you, but all people from this thing. You're probably familiar with Isaiah 53, all the prophets are there about what how Jesus is going to come and lay down his life. You know, crucifixion. Psalm 22 gives great detail about the crucifixion, even though Nobody knew anything about a crucifixion back when, when these two books were written way back in the day. But the prophecy, because the Holy Spirit of God inspired that writing, it's all there. And it was then for them to see that they just took the rap to the instrument. So instead of using the term Messiah when Jesus would talk to the religious Jews, he would use terms that he used. Uh, so far, just in the Gospel of John, he's used them many, many times. You'll be familiar with them. Let me just kind of run through them right quickly because we've been saying them over and over. He would use terms like, I am the Son of God. He would say, I am the Son of Man. I am from the Father. I am from God. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good Shepherd. And we see these terms. I, I just kind of briefly ran back and kind of looked at some of the things that, that he's been saying up to the end. And that's what we're seeing. So we look at verse. No, can I look at that? Yeah, that makes sense. So Jesus 
Jesus was telling them all of these things that should have told them who he was. He also clearly told them as many pertinent things about himself. He said things like this. He said, I told you I came from heaven. If you believe in me, you'll be given eternal life. So he told them, I will judge all of humanity one day. He told them that you should honor me just as you honor God the Father. He told them that all the scriptures speak of you. He told them that, that he perfectly revealed God the Father. That he always glorified the Father. That he never sinned. That before Abraham was, he said, I am. And he told them that he would lay down his life, that he would raise himself at the end of the And so they knew who he was. This religious crowd, they knew who he was, and this was implied by their question, if you are the Christ, and that's, that's the Greek word for Messiah, if you are the Christ, tell us why you know it. I want to make one more point before we move on. I want you to notice the question, the first question at the end of this verse. Verse 24, they gather around and say, How long will you do this? The New King James Version here says, How long will you keep us in doubt? You see what they're doing? They're blaming Jesus for their doubt. How many people today blame God for their doubt? You heard people talk. How many people today say, well, if there was just more evidence, there's just not enough evidence. And so I kind of doubt it. Or they might say, it's just too much of a mystery for me. And so they doubt God. They might say, well, if God is real, why did this happen in my life? Or why did that happen in someone else's life that I know? And so they blame God for their unbelief. This is not just the case of eyes that can't see or ears that can't hear. This is a case of simply not wanting to do because I'm going to testify to you this morning. You read the whole Bible, and everything is in it. It is full of everything. But they didn't want to believe. Theirs was a heart. Not eyes and ears that can't see and hear. Theirs was a heart that had just become too hard to believe. I mean, think about it. No one else is going to touch with Jesus. Learning the truth that the Pharisees did, other than the disciples. The Pharisees were always confronting him. He was always giving them truth, and they still weren't believing because their hearts were so hard. Let me go this way. Let me always say, well, imagine you, you're driving down the road. It's a road that you know pretty well, and you're speeding. And the police officer pulls you over, he comes to the window, and he sees a snow sir, and I'm not even speeding. And you might say, well, yeah, I probably was speeding. But here's the problem, officer. If there were just more speed limit signs along this road, maybe every 50 yards, if you just had more speed limit signs, I probably wouldn't have been speeding. And you know the truth. The truth is, you just don't want to go as slow as the speed limit says. And that's what they were doing. They didn't know the truth. They just wanted, they just refused to believe that truth. And so we look at verse 25. And Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, these testify. So Jesus now points them in two places. He points them to his word, and he points them to his work. 
He says, look at not just what I say, but also look at what I do. Then you decide. You sound pretty confident, doesn't you? Just look at what I say, look at what I do, and then you make the decision. And he sounds confident. How many of you remember an old baseball player named Dizzy Dean? Anybody remember Dizzy Dean? <laughs> but you've heard about him in the Okay, so he, he was one of those guys that uh, he, was, he liked to talk, he had lots of say. Um, and so he would be kind of like Yogi Bear, he was an Yogi Bear. But this one was a pitcher. He was a good pitcher. Up until 1968, he held the National League record for most of the in the season. He had 30 wins in the season. Had a brother named Daffy. What he was good too. Uh, but, but, but he had 30 wins. He was really good at what he did. And he had a he had a saying. He said, uh, he had to drive me to the school. And you know this applies to us as well. As people are saying, we need to what? Did you know that? If you didn't know that, I'm going to make that mention at this point. As people of faith, as people know that you're people of faith, you are being watched by a curious world. But we're being watched to see that what we say about who we believe, about what we believe, then we're looking at to be seen to see if that lines up with what we believe. And like it or not, that's not the case. Probably not the one you plan on doing. You know, we all find your most successful one, and that's not the one you plan on doing. That's the one we're showing more than any other one. People know what we say we believe now, but that's what we do. And they see where we're going to be on the rest. Verse 26. But you do not believe because you are not from He says, you don't believe him, it's not mine. That he was a stranger to them was the evidence of their unbelief. Verse 27 and following, he says, My feet hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. To Jesus Christ. He goes on to verse 29. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father. Now, these verses reveal the blessed result of trusting the Lord Jesus Christ for our salvation. It speaks of the absolute assurance of eternal security. I'm going to tell you, the church has an house to base over eternal security. I'm telling you, we're about to see it right here. Jesus is telling us this. And aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that, that you have eternal security and you don't have to keep yourself Say. If I thought I had to keep myself safe, it would never even be You know, every sin I committed, I would be like, I'm going to lose my I mixed it up. I blew it. You know what I'm saying? Come on. Y'all know where I'm at, right? You would worry you to death too. If you had to worry, if you had to keep your self This is what other religions deal with. This is what they contend with. They can never be sure, first of all, if they're even saved at all. They can't be sure and because they believe that their salvation happens through good works and they're always wondering, am I good enough? Have I done enough? Have I pleased this God enough? And then if they figure out, well, maybe they are saved, you know what, since they are, they're not sure they're going to stay saved. That's what other religions believe. 
there's no peace at all in that kind of salvation. How many say salvation offers him peace? Not that kind. You know why Jesus called this eternal life church? Because that's what it is. It's eternal life. Not just life for a moment or life till you mess it up or, or you know, life till he decides that, you know, maybe you're not all that great after all. It's eternal life. We can never lose it. And it's never, ever because of our own intuitive. You know, all the way to the end and all the way to the end. No, it's never because of that. How futile would that be? So how many of us are having to do this? Any of y'all didn't commit a sin yesterday? We raised your hand. That's what happened. You raised your hand. You say what they are? What they are? Because we do that, don't we? We're sinners. We're still on this side. We're walking around in a dirty world. We can get sin. Thank God we have a forgiving God that's come to you to bring that to me. I'll forgive you. I'll cleanse you. I'll fill you up with my blood. Jesus, what's this? Jesus can. When I make my notes, I usually don't put an end in there. I'll put a little splash in there. I know what you say. You read my notes, you can get to what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. So you can tell it. I'll leave the hands out. That's the end time that you can get to me. Not this one. I wanted it to be there. I put it in there because this, these two verses, in verse 20, 28, Jesus says, No one will be able to snatch you out of my hand. In verse 29, it says, You ain't going to get snatched out of my Father's hand. And I look at that and I say, Good night. That's double security. We are eternally secure in the hands of God. That's the, that's the title of our, our message today. That's a beautiful kind of thing. When I first wrote it, I put the hand of God. And then I read this closer, and I'm like, no, I'm going to put an S on that. The hand of God, the hand of Jesus, the hand of the Father. I mean, we are doubly secure. Let's read on in verse 30. He says, I and the Father are one. That's a pretty profound statement when we really stop to think about it. He's already claimed deity, Godship, in so many ways. And you know what? They knew that. They knew that. And they've already attempted to see him or stone him several times for that very reason, because they knew that, that he had claimed deity. But here Jesus says it in a way that has not been so claimed, not been so straightforward since the very first verse of the gospel where John declared, you remember when we opened up this gospel, in your bulletin there, John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And of course, we know verse 14 tells us that the Word became flesh and flesh upon us. He's talking about Jesus and He said, and he could have said, in Jesus' way. But I want you to notice how deeply profound this statement is. Jesus is now, he's stating, when he said his eye and the Father are one, he's actually stating here that the Father and the Son are distinct. You can look at it closely. He says, I am the Father. In other words, they're not the same person. Listen, listen. The Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Father. They are two separate persons. But then Jesus goes on to say that these two distinct persons are one. The original language connotes here that that one means the same essence or the same nature. What he's saying is this is one God, not two. This is a declaration of the Trinity. When you add the Holy Spirit, you've got three. 
breed person, but they are distinct persons. But at the same time, they are all members of the God. Hard to wrap our minds around that. Three persons, but one God. And he's saying that right here. This, this is a profound statement that these, these Pharisees, they understood perfectly that he was claiming to have the nature of God, that he was God. Look with me in uh, Leviticus 24. Remember? Okay, Lord. Let's read, let's read some more verses first. Let's read one more verse. Verse 31. And so the Jews picked up Psalm to be the same. Alright? Let's say where, where that comes from. In Leviticus 24, verse 11 and then 13 and 14. It's a story about the son of this Israelite woman who ended the camp there. To blaspheme the name. In other words, blaspheme God. Curse. And so they brought him to Moses. And then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Bring the one who is cursed or blasphemed by name outside the camp, and let all who heard him lay their hands on his head, and then let all the congregation stone him. And they just looking back at the Old Testament and they say, Look, we believe you blasphemed. That's worthy of stoning to this. And so, verse 31 says, And they said, Get the stone because they believe he can be blasphemed. When Jesus claimed oneness with God, they knew that he wasn't claiming to be one in vision with God or one in purpose with God. A one in mission with God. But he was claiming to be the exact same nature as God. And so their response, verse 31 following, they said, Put stones of Jesus in the in John 8 59, last verse of the chapter of the chapter of the word, which is his stone. Take the stones up again to stone, and Jesus answered them, Look, Jesus, I love God. I showed you many good works from the Father. Well, which of them are you stoning me? And the Jews answered him, For good work, we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. Because that's what you do with blasphemy. And because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. You might remember how this conversation started. Look at this back at verse 24 at the last part. How long will you keep us in suspense, they ask me, if you are the prophet? Tell us plainly. Tell us plainly. So Jesus says it just as plainly as he can. You know what? They don't like the answer. So they pick up the stone. Because picking up stones was their go to spot. When you don't like what you see or like what you hear, you try to put them in the some rock out of people. But there's some rock out of people that can drop the car in the They're attempting to kill them because of his good work, especially we saw at the chapter. Those that have gone on the Sabbath. Let me tell you something. We talk about the culture. Like, we talk about America. We talk about the culture. We never had a chance. America talks about the most relevant people. We never had a chance. We don't want to have a culture. We don't want to be too much to be there. So, in this culture, culture, with anyone else, Ever makes the claim that Jesus never claimed to be God. His enemy. Even his enemies admit that Jesus claimed to be God. They said in verse 33, he committed blasphemy. Because he claimed to be God. So they lost the argument when it comes to God. Lord, don't talk about it. Leave an argument. Start picking up things. 
So that's what the Jews did as well. Verse 34. He said, Jesus answered me, Has it not been written in your law? I said, You are God. You are God. He was getting that statement to be said, to be God, right? He said, I told him to speak about who he was, but he was God. I want you to notice that in the last three verses, these people have armed themselves with rocks. Yet Jesus bravely continues to stand there and confront them and he continues to Even as they become more and more and more active. They're all holding rocks now, ready to start throwing it. He's continuing with them. And what he's the way to do is this is to reason with them from the old testament scriptures of which they are supposed to know very well. The context of this, this scripture where he says, and he says, you are God, is that God was talking to some judges who were kind of wicked judges. Well, not kind of, they were. They were wicked judges in that world, in that day. And he had given judges in that day great authority to exercise God's divine judgment over the people. And in giving them that kind of authority, he called them God, little Jews. But he chose, but they chose to stand to exercise authority and wickedness. Here's what we read about this in Psalm 82 and the second note I'm just going to read you the whole psalm quick, right? So you'll know kind of what this is about. So somebody's going to ask you one day, why do you have a job? You're going to listen to it. God takes a stand in his own time to get He judges in the midst of the world. How long, he stops to his judgment, how long will you judge unjustly to show partiality to the wicked? He then says, vindicate the weak in the body. Do justice to the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them out of the hands of the wicked. He wanted to be like that. They do not know, nor do they understand. They walk about in darkness, and all the foundations of the earth are shaken. And I said, he said this to the judge, you are God, but no, it's a little G. And all of you are sons of the Most High. Nevertheless, here we go, you will die like me, and fall like any one of the princes, the rise of God, rest the earth, for it to be used in possession of all the men. The point he's saying to him is, if you've got great authority, because you are like God to them, little Jew. In other words, you have my word to give them, but you're not doing it. You're not doing it like I told you. So this is where Jesus has gotten this quote from. Verse 35, 36. So call them God, that, uh, to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken. Did you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world? Is that what said? You are blaspheming because I said, I am the Son of God. And so Jesus makes a comparison between those who are merely called God, little Jews, and the one who is truly God, big Jesus. I want you to notice the phrase, the scripture cannot be broken. See that? In other words, you can't change what's written there, God. It's there. We need to never think that we can outsmart the Word of God or break the Word of God. We'll never break the Word of God if the Word of God is break up. We have to understand it. That's what they were doing. Verse 37. If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe in me. In other words, he's saying, if I'm an imposter, don't listen to me. Goes on to say, but if I do them, though you do not believe in me, believe the works so that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I'm in the Father. In other words, you don't know that I'm not in the Father. Jesus says, why don't you just follow the facts and then do accordingly? Isn't that great advice? Isn't that, isn't that how we come to believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior and our God? By believing the fact about him and then acting accordingly, surrendering our hearts, 
the thing was, when you consider, he, he, he's saying to them, when you consider all the miracles that you've seen me do, shouldn't I convince you that I'm God's representative doing God's work here on earth? So look at verse 39. Therefore, they were speaking again the season, and he alluded to the You see, they're not at all into the fact. They're not all into the evidence that Jesus is trying to get them to see. There is the city, one thing alone, and that was the new name of Jesus Christ. And so verse 40 says, He went away from them beyond the Jordan to his place, where John was first baptized, and he was standing there. So Jesus leaves the temple, he leaves the city. Once he knows, he went back to that place where his ministry happened and his baptism. And likely, knowing his habits as we do, because we read so much about it, he chose to go to this quiet place, away from the town, away from the city, so that he could spend some time in prayer with his father. And in preparation for this battle that was about to come, and he got ready to make that final approach to Jerusalem and to the cross. But even before that, there's going to be another battle. There will be a battle with death, and Lord willing, we'll see that next week. But the point is, what I want you to see is Jesus needed to get away. Pray to prepare and to know that we need to get away from all that stuff that we have in our It's always what you make the best. You just pray and prepare for the day that's coming. That's just the way some of us have to go on. We need to prepare. We need to be prayed up. But Jesus made this reason. Verse 41. And many came to him. And we're saying, while John performed no sign, yet everything John said about this man was true. Now, here's some thinking. They're starting to think about things. He's in a new location, but that doesn't deter their faith with me. Many people, they follow him out there. And they knew that he went to that place where John baptized. And they remembered the words of John the Baptist because they were powerful words. They were highly trusted words. And now they're looking at what John said. They're remembering it. And they're looking at what Jesus has been saying, what Jesus has been doing. And John's words would just be confirmed here. Jesus was the Lord. And he is the Lamb of God. Verse 42. As a result of all of this truth, it came came through confrontation and arguing and all that, but as a result of all this truth, a result of following the facts, a result of acting accordingly, many of the came to faith. This was in large part the message today about belief, about who we believe, and what we believe, and why we believe. It's a picture of religion confronted by truth. It's a story of stubbornness met by fact. And it's a promise about eternal security that we enjoy. So what do we do now? Well, if we learn anything from Jesus in this section of Scripture, it's that we, we know what we believe, right? Therefore, we should share what we know. We know what we believe, so we should share what we know, no matter whether it's accepted or not. We learn here that if we stand firm in our faith, 
some will believe. It looked like there was a lot of rejection going on with all this arguing back and forth. But as soon as those people followed him out, they were ready to stay believed. So when, even when it looks like it's not fruitful, you say something, God can find a word for my I want you to come with me as we get ready to the cover. Let's get some eyes out of it. It says, Behold, I have inscribed you in the palm of my hand. Let's just think about that for a moment. I want you to realize that there are three things in the hand of God. So, you want to see this out of the First of all, We've already seen we're the we're in the hands of our, our Savior being held there securely. The second thing there are our names. They're inscribed right there in his hand. In other words, it's like a reserved VIP parking spot. It's our parking spot. God is reserving the wrong of the Those poems and those things are our guarantee that that work of redemption and salvation is complete. We're about to have an invitation. I know we're running out of cell calls. This is so important. We're about to have an invitation. The altar's going to be open. The front pews are open if you want to sit. Also, I just have a feeling. Some of you are all of you might have been here. It would have been a world of a But we have to deal with it. People who say, we have to deal with stuff that, that lost people don't have to deal with. So we have to deal with their stuff, but we have to do it for them. So it's just a study. Not complicated sometimes. I just want you to know the altar is open. You can stay where you are, but I want to tell you something. There's something special about stepping away from the place and stepping into an intimate time with God and a renewal and all of those worship. You said that Pastor Kenny won't take me to think that I'm feeling something I'm feeling if I came forward. Well, here's the bigger question. Which one of those people out there are not there in the You don't need to worry about what others are thinking. This is a time that your thoughts to be about you and God. From this moment forward, about you and God. Maybe you're someone here today and you realize you don't believe. Not like in the way that Jesus is talking about. This book. Maybe you believe intellectually. You know the facts. You know all about it, but you just realize that it's never become a belief in your heart, in your soul. You realize that this is why I'm struggling so much. This is why I don't seem to get it so much of the time. This is why I lose sleep and why I sometimes come to church. I feel worse after church. Maybe you're maybe you're dealing with that today. I want to tell you, if you come forward and tell me that, that I haven't believed like that, but I want to, me and you will sit down here on this pew, and Glenn will turn off my mic and all that, and we'll whisper and we'll pray to God. Where you're at. Maybe you're one of those who has other kind of belief system. Maybe you you believe, I mean, you really believe in you're, you're you're secure in the hand of God and all that, but your mouth doesn't get tested. Maybe 
one of those that you really, truly, truly believe, but, but fear dominates your life. You're a believer. You know that you're secure in the hands of God. You're, you're, everything makes you fearful. You have trust issues with God. You're afraid of what's coming tomorrow. You're afraid about your finances. You're afraid about your family. You're afraid about whatever. And you just have to come to that place where you believe that point where God really is in control of it all. He really is sovereign. He really does have a plan for your life. And he is the best plan. God wants to take away all that fear. Maybe you're one of those who believe, but your actions don't follow your belief. You know, we all want to move in the right direction. We want to walk lots of steps with God, but sometimes it's just faith and time or a situation that we're like, I do this, but I get it right tomorrow. And we're not moving in the direction of our faith, of the God of our faith. We're not being salt and light in the dark world. And maybe you're one of those who believes that you've got a family member or a friend or a neighbor or a co-worker that God has just burdened your heart about. And you've been salt in life. And you've been saying the right thing. And you've been doing the right thing. And you've been a testimony. But they have not come to Christ but you know that Jesus is there for them. Maybe you just want to come down to the point and intercede. Telling God, God, I know that you're still in this thing with me. And I'm going to sit in this and go. As we sing, we're going to sing about what we believe. And if you have that on me, we'll take as long as you need. Okay? I'm afraid about raising the clock or anything like that. We'll take as long as you need because this is more important than all of that. If you think that you think about what you believe and maybe do you or maybe or at the level that you want to believe, all to the you can accept to deal with that. If you want to bring me in on it, I'm here for you. If not, just do your own thing. If you feel God, that'll be fine. Hold him to the table. He's going to leave it in the We believe. And I'll do it fine. Whatever's going on. Amen. Let's live life. All right. Uh, let's pray. I have the Father, Lord, thank you so much for coming to this earth and dying for us. And Lord, giving us something so special to believe. Lord, that you are our Lord and our Savior, our Redeemer, that you have secured us from in the palm of your hand. And no one can ever pluck us out of your hand to Lord, because we of your word. And we believe that you said in your word, we believe because we are you. And we thank you for that. You gave us that thing. It was great support. And I pray for you that have not yet believed that you'll continue to work in their heart that they too come to believe. Ask the same word in Jesus' name. Amen.